Afghanistan's elite fighters. Congress moves to protect athletes. And brain jams. Andrew McCabe, the deputy director of the FBI, is stepping down immediately ahead of his March retirement as congressional Republicans and President Trump keep up their efforts to undermine everyone involved in the Justice Department's investigation into the president and his campaign. McCabe is a holdover from James Comey's tenure at FBI, and he served as acting director after Comey was fired. Trump has blasted McCabe for his wife's past political activity as a Democratic candidate in Virginia. Deputy Attorney General Ron Rosenstein seems to be next on the list. Late today, the House Intelligence Committee voted to release a secret memo that, according to the New York Times, alleges that Rosenstein acted hastily in approving government surveillance of a Trump associate, Carter Page. The Cleveland Indians announced today that the Chief Wahoo logo will no longer appear on their uniforms, starting in the 2019 season. The logo has been in use since 1947, and in more recent years, it's been criticized for being offensive and racist. The team's name isn't changing. Philippine police have resumed President Rodrigo Duterte's drug war, picking up after a pause last fall, following allegations that police committed extrajudicial killings. Today, officers visited the homes of suspected drug users and dealers and asked them to surrender. This time around, the national police chief said he was optimistic that operations would be less violent than in the past, but he added that he couldn't promise the campaign would be, quote, bloodless. Czech President Miloš Zeman has won re-election with almost 52% of the vote, beating out pro-European academic Yiri Drahoš. Zeman is an ardent nationalist who vehemently opposes admitting Muslim refugees into the Czech Republic and he's called for a referendum on the country's membership in the EU. United Nations employees in Gaza staged a one-day strike today, protesting a decision by the U.S. to cut $65 million in funds for the U.N. agency that provides aid to Palestinians. The 13,000 employees shut down schools, clinics, and food distribution centers. They say the cuts will deprive more than 2 million Palestinian refugees of crucial public services. The State Department has said that it's withholding funds, quote, until further consideration. President Trump has threatened to cut more aid if the Palestinian Authority doesn't return to the negotiating table with Israel. Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez was inaugurated for a second term in office on Saturday in a ceremony guarded by hundreds of military and police officers. Yo, Juan Orlando Hernandez, voy a hacer lo que tenga que hacer para recuperar la paz. The Honduran Constitution explicitly forbids a president from serving more than one term but Hernandez ran for re-election anyway. After the vote, the Organization of American States found so many red flags with the process that it called for a new election entirely. Government security forces, in turn, have killed at least 30 people who were protesting the results. But Honduras is the U.S.'s most critical ally in Central America, and that bond isn't going away anytime soon. Blocks like this one have been common in Tegucigalpa since the elections last November. Jose Manuel Celaya, the former president of Honduras, is frequently at the protests. Celaya was deposed in a military coup in 2009, and he's been the face of the opposition ever since. ¿Qué tiene que ver el golpe que lo destituyó a usted con lo que está pasando hoy? 
es sencillo, no los que están gobernando son los que me sacaron a mí. Son los mismos, hace casi 10 años. The military justified the coup by alleging that Celaya was attempting to run for a second term in violation of the constitution. But the causes were deeper. The country's corporate and political elite felt threatened by his leftist reforms and alliance with Hugo Chavez. At first, the United States condemned the coup. But then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton reversed course and endorsed the coup regime. And that's enabled the ruling national party to stay in power to this day. We believe that President Lobo and his administration uh, have taken the steps necessary to restore uh, democracy. Honduras es casi una provincia de Estados Unidos. Financia los militares, financia los policías. Desconoce las violaciones a los derechos humanos. Los, los enseña a matar, a hacer guerra. Y ahora los tiene haciendo seguridad interna. President Hernández and his party have won the U.S.'s favor by cracking down on gangs and drugs, which, at least in theory, helps prevent migrants from fleeing to the United States. To that end, the U.S. has given more than $111 million to the armed forces and police in the years since the coup. The money kept coming even after Hernández's government was implicated in massive corruption scandals and high-profile political assassinations. Hugo Noe Pino, an economist and former ambassador to Washington, says the U.S. is now propping up a state many see as corrupt and illegitimate. Yo siento que Honduras está recorriendo el camino que nosotros vimos en Guatemala, El Salvador y Nicaragua antes de los años 80. Y lo triste es ver que Estados Unidos esté apoyando este tipo de situación. Que Estados Unidos esté apoyando un país que va en camino a la dictadura. Exactamente, así es. Hernández and his party now control the Congress, the Supreme Court, and the Electoral Tribunal. That's how he was able to pull off exactly the thing Celaya was kicked out for trying to do, running for re-election. Now that the National Party is firmly in control, it can safely ignore its critics. It's normal, sometimes the one who loses has the right to manifest, has the right to reclaim, has the right to dissent, has the right to say that he won. What is there from the critics of the Organization of the United States? Son bienvenidas y son procesos que tenemos que llevar a cabo en las reformas electorales. Pero la OEA no solo propuso reformas, dijo que habían tantos problemas que hasta sugirieron recomenzar la elección. Repetir una elección no está dentro de las bases legales solo por el mandato de una misión o de una organización externa. A week before Hernández's second inauguration, two or three hundred protesters blocked a road near the center of Tegucigalpa. As usual, ex-president Zelaya made an appearance. But people would be protesting with or without Zelaya. People like 21-year-old Yari Garcia. Por un candidato no estamos por un partido político. ¡Asesino! No, no es problema de ideología, es problema de que no se respete lo que, lo que, lo que el pueblo manda. Today in Kabul, five gunmen attacked a military academy, killing 11 soldiers and injuring 15. It was the fourth major terrorist attack in Afghanistan in just the last 10 days. On Saturday, more than 100 people died when an ambulance packed with explosives detonated on a crowded street in the capital. <laughs> Both the Taliban and ISIS are ramping up the pace of their attacks. And the Afghan National Army isn't effective enough to do anything about it. So President Ashraf Ghani is betting on a different strategy, drastically increasing the number of special forces troops who might stand a better chance. Mission. 
This army base on the outskirts of Kabul is the training ground of the Afghan army's elite commando unit. They've been in the fight since 2007, but in the last year they've become a key part of the coalition strategy to beat back the Taliban's gains and stop the wave of bloody insurgent attacks. Commandos represent only about 7% of the Afghan army, but they're responsible for nearly 70% of offensive operations, including night raids alongside US special forces. The plan is to boost the number of commandos from 17,000 to 30,000 troops to help bolster a military exhausted by persistent attacks from the Taliban and ISIS. Uh, we have uh, a sense in Afghanistan, when you uh, try hard in training, yeah, the, uh, no one can defeat you on the ground. But even among these fighters, there's a recognition that the Taliban are gaining momentum. How does your family feel about you doing this course and, and graduating as a, as a commando? Amir Oais was trained in the US and served as a platoon commander in the Afghan army for 14 years before he joined this special operations unit, supervised by US special forces. He asked us not to use his last name in order to protect his family, who live in a rural area under threat from the Taliban. But word has already gotten out about what Mirawais does for a living. Coming from where you come from, what are the difficulties and challenges that you face in, in, in choosing this, this path? The average commander earns around $50 a month, higher than the average Afghan soldier, and a hard salary to turn down. But as the Taliban's control of territory in Afghanistan expands, the risks are deepening. Over the past year, around 10,000 Afghan security personnel have been killed and 16,000 wounded. But UN data also shows that 10 civilians a day were killed on average in the first nine months of last year. And politicians are hearing that a growing number of those are military families being targeted. Mirwais Yassini represents Nangarhar province the scene of last week's attack on the regional office of Save the Children, which killed four and wounded dozens. These elders have traveled from Nangarhar to Yassini's office in Kabul, hoping for answers. How about the investment the American government is making into the special forces, <coughs> training thousands of commandos? Yeah, they will increase the forces, but the forces are not uh, uh, the solution. It's been two months since former USA gymnastics physician Larry Nasser pleaded guilty to multiple counts of sexually assaulting girls. And Congress has finally started to focus on the biggest sex scandal in sports history. But it's not just gymnastics. There are now more than a dozen lawmakers on Capitol Hill calling for investigations into sexual abuse in various sports overseen by the United States Olympic Committee, or pledging to hold hearings of their own. Both House and Senate Commerce Committee leadership have sent letters to USOC, USA Gymnastics, Michigan State University, and other sports organizations asking for more details on the allegations of sexual abuse and questioning whether each sport has enough oversight. 
That's after Senators Gene Shaheen and Joni Ernst kicked off the latest round of congressional scrutiny by asking Senate leadership to establish a select committee to investigate the USOC and USA Gymnastics. And New York Democratic Representative Carolyn Maloney wants the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee to launch an investigation as well. So it seems everybody agrees something should be done. And today, lawmakers did take a major step when they took up legislation to strengthen protections for victims of sexual abuse in amateur sports. The legislation would require sexual harassment training, mandate that any assault allegations be reported to law enforcement immediately, and it would create a new system for how athletic governing bodies handle sexual abuse allegations. But hearings and calls for investigations are pretty typical on Capitol Hill and never seem to accomplish much. After all, there are three Russia investigations going on right now with no end in sight. But in this case, there's actually past evidence hearings can encourage reforms, like they did in 2003, the last time Congress scrutinized the USOC. Back then, USOC leadership was plagued by infighting and allegations of ethics violations. And Congress held multiple hearings and crafted legislation aimed at reforming the organization. The legislation never passed, but the scrutiny encouraged the USOC to implement reforms anyway. I spoke to Michigan Democratic Representative Debbie Dingell, who's called on the Commerce Committee to investigate Michigan State University's role in the USA gymnastics scandal. Well, I think the Congress has got a responsibility to investigate this and make sure that it never, ever, ever, ever happens again. And how did it happen? So on the House side, the Energy and Commerce Committee is the Committee of Jurisdiction. We're pleased that the committees agreed to hold hearings and conduct a very bipartisan investigation into the Dr. Larry Nasser case. But not only that, but who knew what happened? And my fear is that this is the tip of an iceberg at universities across the country. The encephalophone is, it's kind of an academic name really, but this is a music-based device. Taking brain signal and turning it into music. It just literally means brain instrument. Another way to explain it would be it's a music prosthetic. It converts thoughts into music. My name's Thomas Duell. I'm a uh, neurologist at Swedish Hospital, and I am also a professor in the School of Music at uh, the University of Washington. I was studying brain-computer interfaces and I was studying music, and I was studying neurophysiology. So it just kind of became a, a kind of a mad scientist project. It started off as an art project. I thought it would be neat. What about the if you had the, is there a trumpet sound? So yeah, you have there's the a trumpet sound. Trumpet and then the acoustic trumpet. Yeah, it would be kind of cool. Let's try it. Sure. sure. Yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> we can completely change the sound envelope okay. of, the, of the tone, and so it sounds more like a human instrument. There's many signals coming out from many different electrodes, but in one area, it's a, like a resting uh, signal for the motor cortex. We ask people to either relax, where we get the maximum amount of that signal, that's the resting potential, or think about moving. And then we make a scale from one to eight. We chose one to eight for a few reasons, but the first is just, since this is a music-based device, we wanted to come up with the notes of a, of a scale. It was just kind of an art project. But then, I'm at the same time, I'm working in the hospital, and I'm seeing a lot of these patients who have strokes or they have other motor disability from other diseases, ALS or brain hemorrhages or tumors. I begin to, to think I could take this 
thing I made as an art project, I could use it to restore musical ability to people who've lost it. So someone who has severe arm mobility issues, for example, we're gonna be using the part of their brain that normally controls that arm. We would hope that we'd be able to actually improve the connectivity in that part of the brain. That's certainly a likely benefit, and it's something we would like to study. You got your uh, joystick going. You doing okay? I was originally diagnosed in, with MS in 2005. I was 35. At this point, I have only the, the most simple control of my body below my neck. What Jonathan's part of here is a clinical trial that we started, which is trying to take the encephalophone, which up until this point we've been using with healthy individuals, to see if those people who have motor disability, if they're able to achieve some level of control. So this is the signal that we're reading. It's the left side and the right side. It's not gonna be very musical because it's a test. You're gonna hear an organ type sound that he's trying to match. He's the piano. All right, here we go. I'm trying to influence the direction it's going. It's more sort of how I'm concentrating. So I'm trying to relax more, trying to move my hand a little bit more to try and make it go up or down. It's kind of the level of control that I have with it. So if I think about relaxing my hand, relaxing my, my mind, then the note will go higher. And there's a little bit of noise in there, so if I start thinking about lunch or something like that, then I'll notice it'll affect. So that was his brain in real time, sonified as, as a piano. So now what we'll do is we'll allow him to play freely. Uh, this is fun, but it's also training because he's learning to control his signal. By doing more of it, I feel like I'm getting better. My days are often not so filled with stuff, so definitely feels like I'm making the music and that's that's pretty magical. That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, January 29th, 2023.